Good evening, everyone. Good evening uh, and welcome to uh, our UPL office and to the UPL book talk today. Uh, we are joined by um, Professor Emeritus Jeff Wood. Um, he's at the... Uh, he's Emeritus Professor of International Development at the University of Bath and the author of the book we are discussing today, uh, Staying the Course, um, Journey of a Bengal Civilian. And uh, in conversation with him is uh, Barrister Manzoor Hassan. Uh, he's the Executive Director, uh, Center for Peace and Justice uh, at the Brack University. Um, of course, both are uh, old and long friends of UPL and ourselves and um, friends of each other as well. So the idea today is really to uh, have a conversation about uh, Professor Wood's long years of engagement with uh, Bangladesh, his work uh, in various capacities, uh, primarily as a researcher and uh, development practitioner. and. Um, and his reflect personal reflections as well. And thank you both for, for making time and uh, for doing this today. I think you know, there, there is uh, the purpose of uh, having this book written was to capture the part of history uh, for generations to come about the early days of Bangladesh and you know, uh, where we are today and uh, uh, to have the perspectives of, of an outsider who also worked like an insider. So uh, we're really looking forward to this conversation and thank you, uh, Mansur Bhai, for taking this time to um, join in this conversation. Uh, so uh, with that, we, we uh, apart from uh, our guests here, we warmly welcome you to this event today and we also have um, a number of guests online uh, through Facebook. So uh, you're, you're live. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Good okay, to know. yes. Um, so, um, okay, so let us uh, go on to the conversation. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you and uh, enjoy. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Maruk. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Can you all hear me? Uh, are we audible? Yes. Good. And thank you for inviting, and it's wonderful to be here with Jeff to have this conversation. Uh, and I was thinking that, you know, uh, we could divide this this conversation to four chunks. I thought that in the first chunk could be about the book project itself, how it all started, yeah? And then the second bit could be his arrival, your arrival and your experience of Bangladesh in the 70s and your thoughts about that. And then the third chunk I thought could be about Prashika NGO experience, you know, reflection on that period. And finally the fourth, it would be to kind of looking ahead, you know, in terms of what we what we see coming in, in a, over the next 50 years. If you can look into the crystal ball, how how do you feel about okay, that? Okay, that sounds good to me. Okay, I'm in your hands. <laughs> good, and and let me let me say that you're not in the witness box, <laughs> so you won't be cross-examined and examined by me. We will have a conversation, so we'll enjoy it. Enjoy this conversation, and I think we have a quick Q and A question answer session at the end. Please, yes. so please uh, make notes of questions that you all would like to put to Jeff at some point at, at, when I finish. That would, you know, so we can we can also get some uh, participation of the audience. Yeah, yeah, good. So let's make a start. I mean, I was looking at the book and and reading the book, and I got the distinct feeling, Jeff that it's not just one book. We are talking about two books here. You know, you get, you know, buy one, get one free. <laughs> you know, it's something like that. So the one, the first book is about, I think it's about the, your relationship with individuals, your life. And, and it's, it's kind of a lovely account of all the people you have met. And, and that I think is one bit of the book, which is very enjoyable. And, and easy reading, so to speak, yeah? And the other book is the theoretical side of things, you know? And you go into much depth about development and uh, different philosophical background in terms of thinking and, and can be quite difficult also to maneuver around that particular bit. But it's a kind of a good kind of amalgamation of the two, I thought. 
you know. So congratulations on putting such a fascinating book together. My first question to you is, you know, where did you get this in the inspiration to write this book? I mean, you know, who, and who was the, who you felt was going to, going to be the audience of this book? If you could start with those two questions. I, I certainly can, and thank you very much to UPL for inviting me here for this occasion, and also to you, Manzor, um, who have known each other for a, a long time, and I've never had a dull conversation with Manzor over, over many years, so it's always fascinating to be uh, together. And... Um, discussing our passions about Bangladesh and life here and the ways in which it can be made better for so many people across the country. Um, well, this, I mean, I suppose I need to just preface a little bit before talking about um, how the book started by how I started in Bangladesh, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, and, um, you know, when you're in development studies, it's a bit hard to classify where you are in terms of a discipline, social science discipline. But basically, during 71, 72, I was living in a village in northeast Bihar, in Purnia district, as it was then, um, and I was only about 40 miles away from the border with East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. Um, and indeed, when the war started in December uh, 71, I could hear the shelling, um, the pounding of the, of the shelling. And indeed, I was caught up in a few conversations at that time with the commissioner for the area being visited by people from Mrs. Gandhi in Delhi about the whole, what the strategy would be for India to be involved in the liberation of Bangladesh. And there are other stories about that which probably should not even be told yet today um, in terms of what I heard. But um, when that moment came, uh, in which the Pakistan army admitted uh, defeat. Um, I had been back in the district town, Purnia, and I remember coming out in the, in the morning to this news, and we were near to a small army cantonment, and suddenly people were all around me saying, Jai Bangla, Jai Bangla, Jai Edward Heath, Edward Heath, and Edward Heath was the British Prime Minister at the time, and one of the first of the sort of major politicians globally to instantly recognize uh, Bangladesh. And so I suppose my sort of identity started a little bit at and, that time. And, and Sheikh Mujibur Rahman on his release went over to the UK and was, was invited by Edward Heath to, to go to 10 Downing Street. Indeed, yes. Uh, with lots on his way back from Pakistan yes. to, to Bangladesh. So the, the links were very strong. And there are other Bideshis from the UK um, who also have strong memories of, of that time and some little bit of involvement by Oxfam and relief work uh, and so on. So I was felt committed to Bangladesh and its liberation. Um, and we came here then in August 74 after various attempts to set up my presence here and I was supported by the Ford Foundation at that time. I was attached to the Bangladesh Academy for Rural Development in Camilla. So we lived in Camilla. Uh, so across you, 74. So you first came here in 74. August 74. August 74. Yeah. So you could say now we're in December 23. It's just short of 50 years yeah. of, uh, of, of association. Now, let's jump 50 years or 48 years or whatever to the writing of this book. Um, so Maruk's dear father, 
founder of UPL, Muhyiddin Ahmed. Um, we had, he had found me, or I had found him, um, back in the uh, early 90s, um, by which time I had written lots of papers and had some international publications and so on. Um, and, he, and I had a lot of unpublished papers, uh, which I didn't quite know what to do with about Bangladesh. And at that time, he invited me to put them all together into a volume that became known as Bangladesh, Whose Ideas, Whose Interests. And I was fascinated by, I mean, who, who was really dominating the policy discourse and the ideas in Bangladesh at that time? Was it donors with lots of money and Bangladesh feeling obliged to follow the money, as it were, and follow ideas coming from outside? Um, or was it a reflection of interests in the political economy uh, within Bangladesh? And I, I put together, I mean, these papers have been written in a way for other purposes, but they all demonstrated that kind of tension between ideas external through aid programs and all the rest of it, and the ideas that people had in Bangladesh. And of course, by that time, there were so many innovative ideas in Bangladesh coming from, in particular, the NGO civil society sector. Um, so that was then. And then, many years later, um, just before COVID, really, uh, 2019, I was uh, sitting with Moedin and Marouk and a few others in a coffee house in Gulshan. And he said, why don't I now try to write this kind of book, um, reflecting on all these years of liberation and my association with Bangladesh over its uh, history. Um, and I, yeah, I thought that's a challenge, um, but it's a challenge I would enjoy. Um, and in a way, I suppose, COVID helped me because there I was locked down at home um, and my wife and I were experiencing 24-7 for the first time in our lives because I'd spent so much time here and elsewhere traveling, working and so on. We were not used to being together for so long. So she was quite keen to ban banish me to my study and um, not see me until the end of the day, except for a few cups of tea or whatever. So, so that's how it emerged. And, and basically, I mean, a bit more about the process itself. Did you, did you keep notes of, the, uh, of your work, events over the last 40, 50 years? Or how did you do this? How did you put all this together? Um, because it's quite detailed account. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I didn't have notes in that sense. Um, I did have lots of papers lying around and I had UPL books on my shelves that I'd already published because there are quite a few more than the two that I've mentioned. Um, so I knew I would be able to kind of go back and at some point reference and be more precise. But I thought the best way to approach this would be just to cut through almost in a stream of consciousness really from my own memory um, and, uh, and at first I didn't have a structure. I just thought if I did it kind of chronological and also when I started moving through these different phases, I could pick out key descriptions or phrases and then use them as headings. So then I started to have that stream of consciousness with headings and then I started grouping those headings into chapters and parts. And that, in the end, is how the, how the structure of the book became formalized. So it was a kind of inductive process, really. A number of iterations oh, yes. in the process. Oh, yes. I, had, um, I probably had a full draft early manuscript by the end of 2020. Okay. Um, so it took you... 
it took me about eight or nine months probably. To put this together, okay. Um, there were interruptions because sometimes I had to do the gardening, sometimes I had to cook uh, and clean because our cleaners couldn't come, lockdown and all the rest of it. So, you know, there were domestic duties to uh, attend to um, in order to share that um, with my wife. So, um, yeah, um, first draft by the end of 2020, pretty rough. So then um, 2021, going back over that, shaping it a bit more, I got a couple of people then to read that second draft. One, a friend of mine, Harry Blair, in uh, America, who has spent a lot of time also yes. in Bangladesh and India and published here and so on, well known to me, we're good friends. And then I got somebody else in the UK, not connected at all with Bangladesh or with the specifics of my life and so on, but who I trusted as an independent reader to give me an idea of the flow of it, the comprehensibility of it, and so on. And with those two sets of remarks, I then went through into a, a third draft and then came into um, association with UPL's wonderful copy editor. Right. Okay, so that was the final stage. And that became the final stage, with a little bit of tweaking. I was here in August 22, um, and I was able to do a final bit of tweaking, sitting here um, with some of the UPL staff and getting it into the final manuscript before it went to print. Wonderful. Finally, I'd like to hear a bit more about the title. Ah. I know you, you've written uh, quite a bit on it, where you've taken this from, the idea where it came from. Could tell us a bit more about okay. that. Well, there are two bits to the title, as you can see. So let me deal with the first bit first in capitals. Um, you will have gathered, perhaps, that I'm not an economist. I'm more of an anthropologist, but I kind of work in political economy, <coughs> class structures and struggles and all that. So the thing about economists, and I was the head of an economics department for five years, economics and international development at Bath. And even when I first joined the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex, uh, soon after I graduated, I was almost the only non-economist or non-public administration person in the Institute at that time. So it's used to being in a minority, that's for sure, in a disciplinary sense. But economists, rightly or wrongly, have a set of tools which they can take with them around the world. And as long as I'm being a bit naughty here, but as long as they've got a data set, um, quantitative data set, preferably, um, then they can start doing all kinds of analysis and regressions and so on and move from correlations to causations and identify trends and attribute uh, causation through regressions and so on. So they have a set of tools and they can, in some sense, land anywhere. So you can see development economists moving around. But I suppose my gentle critique of that is that their work tends to be decontextualized. Um, and the point about being, in particular, an anthropologist trying to get into the deep structures of a society and the relationships and institutions and how they work and so on, is that you really do have to spend time there. Right. Um, and you have to build up lots of quite intimate relationships with informants and friends and colleagues, some of whom are here, um, in order to really get, try and do your best to get inside that picture. And that means, as it were, hanging around for quite a long time um, and not just you know, moving in, on. Parachute out. Uh, parachuting in and coming out, that's right. So staying the course is a reference to that. If we come to the second part of the title, the book starts by me recalling um, a book by a colonial officer in uh, what was, of course, United India. Uh, his name is John Beams. And the book was published 
I think from memory in 1901 or 1905 or something. Um, and I completely recommend that book to anybody interested in that colonial presence in Bengal. Um, and I bought many copies and given them away uh, to people still, because... Still available? It is, yes. It's been reprinted. And you reprinted. can buy it in paperback. You can order it on Amazon and so on. And it's called The Memoirs of a Bengal Civilian. And the reason I came to know about this book is that I was sitting in the district office in near district in North Bihar and as you know these offices always have these signboards with all the district collectors names and looking back I saw this name John Beams and somehow I found out that he'd written this book the memoirs of a Bengal civilian and it's such a, a wonderful book and he was in Pune uh, well actually he started in the Punjab um, I think he probably blotted his copybook somehow and got reposted to Purnia, which was seen then in the Bengal presidency as a punishment po posting because the water was considered to be poisonous. There was lots of dangerous wildlife, rhinos and snakes and all the rest of it, lots of mosquitoes. So it was considered to not be a good place to be. But he survived. But he, not only did he survive, but he was the original creator of the district gazetteer, okay. which these colonial officers built up. History, um, fauna, flora, culture, and all the rest of it. So it, that was an important book for me in my field work to un understand that and understand that history. So I was in awe, really. He then moved to Arissa, where he was the divisional commissioner. And then he moved to Chittagong. Um, and in Chittagong, he was not very happy. And he was a bit rude about Chittagong. Um, and all those Lascars and sailors and all the rest of it. And I don't think he really understood it. Um, but he had a period there. And then he came back into... Calcutta into the head office, as it were, of the Bengal presidency, before at some point returning to the UK. And he, he touches on all that in his book? Yes. It's all his Absolutely. Uh, all the, yes. And you have, got a, you have a copy of the ga Gazetteer? If I'm not yes, mistaken, I, it's you... still on my shelves. I gave away a lot of books when I uh, retired. Um, I'm beginning to regret that now, but I did. Um, I think my collection is one twentieth of what I had. Um, but I kept I still, the still have that. Okay, yes, wonderful. Yes, yes. Okay, so we, next time when you, you can bring it along and we can have a look. But that kind of takes me into the next phase of our discussion, the next portion of our discussion, which is really you making an entry into Bangladesh in 74. I know you talked about this, you touched on this. 74 was the time when you came over. We were going through a very, very difficult time, right? A turbulent time, yes, transition. A huge transition was taking place, and you arrived, right? Yeah. And was it a, despite the fact that you spent a number of years in India, how, how was that experience coming over? And we well, came with Angela. Yes, I right. will. It was um, certainly a shock. Um, I had um, persuaded my wife, we, we married in India in September 71. We broke up my time away living in the village um, by getting married in the middle of it. Um, and then Angela went back to the UK and I went back to my village, my village. Um, so the first six months of our married life, we were separated. It's a tricky start to a, a marriage, of course. So when it came to wanting to take my bit of emotional attachment to the liberation of Bangladesh into reality, um, I said to Angela, um, look, Bengal, it's just the rich center of so much culture in music and art and history and literature and so on. I said, you know, are you prepared to suspend your professional social work career? She was employed in that by the, the state, as it were, and for us to be together. So 
she nobly agreed to do that. So we arrived together in August 1974 into the old airport. And of course it was a chaotic arrival in which some of our belongings were plundered by the customs officials as, uh, as was the case perhaps at that time. Um, and, um, and then we managed to get from the airport down to the Porbani Hotel in Murtigil. Porbani Hotel was not finished actually, still smelt of wet concrete. Um, as we drove down from the airport to Motijil, um there were bodies all over the place. Well, we don't know. Were they asleep, having come in from the countryside for the protection that Dhaka could offer, and maybe some of them were deceased. You could not tell. But there were hundreds of bodies on the pavements, on the sides of the street, and so on. So, of course, it was a, a great traumatic shock to both of us to see this. Um, and, of course, we did see you know, more devastation uh, in those early days, evidence of it. Um, because I was being supported by the Ford Foundation, we paid a visit to the Ford Foundation office, um, and they, their view was, you are attached to the Bangladesh Academy for Rural Development in Camilla, so you don't need to spend any time with us. Um, and we thought Dhaka was so shocking, we immediately got a flight, because in those days you flew because there was no road link and there were three ferries and all that, um, no bridges. Um, so we actually flew, it was only 50 miles, but we flew into uh, Camilla Airport where initially we were not met. Usual problems of communications and so on. And it was pouring with rain and the, the plane landed a long way away from the hut, which was supposed to be the airport uh, itself. And um, by the time we got the bags from the plane to the shelter, they were all soaking wet and all the rest of it. We were not feeling our best. But phone calls were made from the hut. Uh, people came down to meet us, and then they took us to the campus. You, you finally, the car appeared. Finally, a car appeared. An old Buick. To take you home. Which we took us to the, the academy. academy campus in Kotwali, the Kotwali Tane. Yeah. But tell us, why, was, why did you pick on Kumila Academy? What was ah, the reason behind that? Well, what kind of okay, made yes. that happen? Um, the connection that brought me to Bangladesh specifically then was that a, a, a senior colleague of mine at Institute of Development Studies, Michael Lipton, who has just died actually, um, he was here working with some of your senior people, Musharraf Hussein, Momwa Hussein, I think, uh, Noel Islam, in the preparation of the first five-year plan. And in that process, Obaidullah Khan, CSP, who had come back from having had a year in China, really, during the liberation itself, um, he happened to be away, he was looking for someone to look at the Krishi Samabai Shimiti, the cooperatives in uh, the academy in Kumala. Because just before all the uh, struggles, the liberation, Akhtar Hamid Khan himself had done what he called the Tour of Twenty Tana. This is before the liberation? In 1970. And he had written, in a way, an auto-critique of how effective these cooperatives were at being cooperatives in having people come together in some kind of equal relationship in these cooperatives. Um, and Obadullah 
Khan, who was at that point the Secretary of Rural Development, was of course looking to how there should be a rural development strategy for the country. And the thinking at that time from the government, Mujib and so on, was that the Camilla model should become the model for the rest of Bangladesh. But Obadullah wanted, as it were, to do a reality check because if the cooperatives were not really working under the conditions, I call them mini fundist in the end, of the dense population in Camilla, then could they really work, these cooperatives, across other parts of Bangladesh that were much more hierarchical, inequality, more kind of quasi-feudal in the relationships between landlords and tenants and landless and so on. So were the, were the cooperatives working in Bangladesh? And he wanted somebody with a kind of anthropological perspective to get in deep to these relationships and find out how that was going. So that's, and that was me. That was your agenda. Michael Lipton said, I think I know the person in the UK and that was me. So Baidullah and Michael Lipton, they obviously knew each other and, and they, basically, they basically found yeah. you yeah. to yeah. do this work. That's what happened, yeah. So you came in with this agenda to actually look at poverty and how to alleviate a poverty, come up with a model or criti critiquing some of the uh, things which were going on in Bangladesh at that time. Well, uh, what, more, was your, what was your terms of reference? More initially to look at the agrarian structure and to look at inequality in it, not poverty per se okay. um, at that time, but to look at the agrarian relations and to see whether it was realistic to, as it were, impose cooperatives on them and assume that you could have an equal membership of those cooperatives and that people would get equal advantage out of those cooperatives in terms of access to inputs, green revolution and so on, as well as being able to market their project. And there was the equivalent of Kumila Academy in West Pakistan. Yes, there was. Right. And I had a weak connection with it subsequently. Um, the Peshawar uh, Academy for Rural Development uh, in, yeah, in Peshawar. And one of the, I mean, the sort of, you could say, uh, almost at the same time, a bit later, uh, the equivalent of Akhtar Hamid Khan was a man called um, uh, Shweb Sultan Khan. And he worked in part, Peshawar Academy for Rural Development, founded that same way as Akhtar Hamid did here. And then Shweb Sultan Khan went on to become the founder general manager of the Aga Khan Rural Support Program in northern Pakistan. Jeff, two, two points. One is, I would say, what was the upshot of your work that you did at the academy? You know, I, you, there's a lot that you can talk about, but I, we, I'd like to ask you to summarize what, what was the main uh, sort of... Uh, output out of that yeah. and secondly I mean I can follow I'll remind you of this but secondly you're you're moving away from academia to applied work you know I mean if you could connect the two I will okay thank you um, well the the formal output basically the way the work was done in Camilla is that I I was allocated a team of staff, they were called instructors, but you could say lecturers, um, at the academy, even though I was very young myself at that time, 29 or whatever, um, but, or younger actually, um, but um, when I explained to them that they would need to be spending long times in the field, they were not so keen to work with me. Um, because they were used to, yes, making visits, but they were used to collecting their data through enumerators. Um, but my methods were more anthropological than needed to be. So actually, I lost a few staff 
overnight. You know, they pleaded with the director, please, can we avoid working with Jeff Wood because he wants us to go and sit and live in the village for weeks at a time and we don't want to do that. So I had a smaller team, but they were devotees, you could say. Right. So I, with my partner Angela, um, we selected a village and we worked in that village um, through about eight months, I could say. Um, living close by, but not in, but visiting it every day, pretty much. Sometimes I had to go into the academy. And my colleagues, they selected other villages. And they then, we did workshops, training, if you like, about village studies and so on. And they worked in those, and we communicated a lot between us, sharing what we were finding, coaching and training each other. I had a lot to learn. And the book that we produced out of that was called Exploitation and the Rural Poor. Right. Um, it was a red book. Yeah, I remember. And it was published in 1976 and then immediately reprinted in 1978. Red book with the yellow... With yellow titles. titles. Yeah, yes, I remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, so that was the formal out output. Um, but obviously what that was telling... Yes was that um, we needed to be cautious about replicating the Camilla model without thought, if you like, to the rest of Bangladesh. So one size doesn't fit all. One size does not fit all. And I was learning about the rest of Bangladesh through developing my friendship and association, which persisted all the way through with Abu Abdullah who, of course, have been doing a lot of writing uh, around the sort of quasi-feudal nature of Bangladesh at the time of liberation and afterwards. So I was learning that Camilla was not typical of the rest of Bangladesh. Right. And therefore, simply rolling out that model would not easily apply to the rest of Bangladesh. Right. So that was the message right. of the book. And of course, it was really an uncomfortable message for the Ministry of Rural Development and later on the Bangladesh Rural Development Board, which was staffed by lots of people who had been at Camilla at the Academy. And so they had come into the ministry and into thinking about policy and rollout, very committed to the idea of replicating the Camilla model and here was this awkward piece of work saying, uh-uh, don't do that. So that was a serious indictment? Yeah. Uh, indictment? It was, in a way. But if I can just move forward slightly. Mm. Um, so that's how we kind of left it when we came back to have our... Angela's pregnant by this time. When we came back to have our first child in late... 75, which means, of course, that we were here in Camilla for the coup against uh, Mujib and his family. We know the history of that between us. Um, so um, I was back in the UK. Uh, my head of department had very kindly kept my post open. So I went back to teach and lecture and all of that and to think and do some writing beyond the book about all of this. But in the meantime, uh, Obadullah and I, because I kind of worked really closely with him, we agreed that we needed to know more about landlessness uh, across Bangladesh. And he commissioned a piece of work through USAID, which became known as the Land Occupancy Survey. And that was published in 1977 and that was a, a terribly critical piece of work um, authored by you mainly authored by you no 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 no. I had nothing to do with it you had nothing to no, do with it this was authored by two Americans two Americans whose okay. names I'm just trying to recall but it will come back to me um, but the point here is that you know even then 
you could say 90% of the population of Bangladesh was in some sense rural, and 50% of that population was effectively landless. Small handkerchief pockets of land, few decimals, but essentially landless, not unable to be subsistence family farmers. Just having the homestead, probably. Yes, yeah, well, a little bit more than a homestead, but, but mainly often not. So this was a shock, I think, when this information became public into the public domain. Because, you know, although we, by 77, the country had moved away from a Wami League democracy, if you like, at that time, into a military government, nevertheless, that liberation idea of Bangladesh being a nation of small farmers with not much class difference between them, you know, that was never true. And Abu Abdullah's work was very clear about that. But this study, with a lot of stats, good stats, told you that actually it was a very unequal, hierarchical society in the main part with a big, big problem of landlessness and none of the rural development thinking in the ministry and all the rest of it were engaging with that section of the population at all. They were landless agricultural workers, some were sharecroppers, um, and they were within these very hierarchical, patron-client, dependent, feudal-type relationships. And I came back at the end of 77, at Obaidullah's information, because I'd been in India, in South India, at the Agriculture University there, with my family, and he asked if I would come back to spend a few months at the beginning of 1978 in Bangladesh with a planning unit that he had now created. Um, I think by then in the Ministry of Agriculture, and I think he had shifted to the Ministry of Agriculture at that time. And Mr. Annie Suzerman, who has just died, by the way, became the Secretary of Rural Development. Okay, so, so that was this that was the new agenda the new subject that you came in yeah. to look at to then focus upon landlessness and poverty and how strategies could be evolved for the support of the landless yeah so uh, thank you i mean if you could move on to the third theme and i think here you can also I bring in the work of landlessness that you, you did and others who were involved with that kind of work is the role of the NGOs in Bangladesh, yeah. right? And you were particularly involved with Prashika. I was. And for nearly, what, 25 years? Yes. And yes. that is an amazing period of time that you spent looking at the NGO sector in Bangladesh. Yeah. If you could tell us your experience of that sector and how, I'll, I'll come to this later, but mm. how that has evolved over the years and where we are now. Yeah. But initially, your, your yeah. participation in the Well, Well, um, my assistant in the academy was a, a wonderful man, Yaya Pari, who alas died during COVID. Um, and he was, and he was uh, the brother of Fazal Bari, who was one of the instructors at the uh, academy um, and um, Yaya put me in touch with um, because we went back in 78 to visit the academy yeah to say hello to everybody and you know catch up after having been away um, and he put me in touch with Camilla Prashika because at that point Camilla Prashika was there were two entities, entities. Uh, Camilla Prashika and Adaka Prashika. And, um, and I was introduced to Rahatuddin, um, and we had lots and lots of conversations and so on. I was very inspired by what I was listening to, and he kept talking about this presence of Dhaka Prashika um, and somebody called uh, Kazi Farooq. Um, and... Um, and then, in a very strange way, you could say, 
I was transferred between Camilla Prashika to Dhaka Prashika by boat in the middle of a lake in the Haal area one foggy morning. And I literally moved from the Camilla Prashika boat across to the Dhaka Prashika boat. I knew none of them in the middle of the lake. Sean was by. I don't know whether you were on that boat at that time. You were not on that boat. Sounds very dramatic. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> and a bit scary because I had no idea who I was going to. But at that time, and several times afterwards, Prashika felt the need not to be too public about his thinking and what it was trying to do. It was supported by the Canadian, um, uh, well, CUSO initially, the Canadian Volunteer Service, but it quickly became a Bangladeshi NGO, and then it was supported by the Canadian International Development Authority, Canadian CEDA. So then I came to Dhaka and to Mohammedpur and became known to uh, the people in Prashika. And we, we um, I mean, they were familiar with the exploitation of the rural poor book. Um, uh, they knew a little bit about my kind of Marxian political economy thinking and I suppose the early conversations was me sharing all that thinking and literature and all the rest of it and putting that into uh, the team of colleagues and Shambhas Bai over there was a, an early part of that process and it continued from there. Um, now why Prashika for me? Um, well, lots of inspiration, lots of great colleagues, lots of passionate thinking, an enormous rural field commitment. Um, you know, and that story just got stronger and stronger over two decades. Um, but there was a key element to it, which I felt I fitted into very well. And it really comes from Mao Zedong, actually, um, which is that when poor people are trying to improve their livelihoods in these very hostile, hierarchical economies, political economies, and they have to be able to walk on two legs. You cannot just mobilize people in a kind of revolutionary sense to protest, to try and obtain access to land, to protest over exploitative wages, to protest over crop shares, um, and so on, debt, indebtedness, and so on. You can't expect them to do that protest when they are likely to be suppressed and probably violently as well. You can't expect them to put, in effect, their whole subsistence at risk because they were working for these people that they needed to struggle against as agriculture workers, sharecroppers, and so on. So they also needed something in their belly they needed support for their immediate livelihoods. So two legs, mobilization, protest, and a strong element of class struggle, let's be clear, but also an element of income generating, uh, where people could diversify from just being agricultural workers, support for small business, support for some liquidity to tide them over so that they could avoid being in debt to exploitative money lenders and so on, uh, so that they had some prospect of security, livelihood security, which of course would embolden their ability to protest and mobilize as well. And that was, that was Proshika's brand. But it wasn't just Prashika, was it, in those days, in the, late, in the 70s and the 80s? You had other NGOs doing similar sort of work. 
That uh, conscientization, were, yes. you know, the functional education, that's right. Paulo Freire's philosophy, yes. all that came in, right? Yes, that's right. But it, um, and of course, Brat was an example of that at the very beginning. And indeed, some of the staff in Prashika had started out with Brack and then had moved over. And then there was also, from the early 80s, um, Gonoshaja Shongsta, GSS, and I might say as a footnote that um, since I was on the Oxfam Asia Committee in the UK, we have played a part in funding, some funding in these early stages of these organizations. Uh, not large amounts of money, but crucial amounts of money uh, 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 at that time to support this. But um, can I just interrupt mm, you for a second? Mm. I isn't this kind of bit uh, strange or sort of uh, politically interesting that you had donors coming in to undermine the political elites in Bangladesh? Is that what you were expecting would happen through this kind of movement and activities? by Prashika and others? I'm just, yeah. uh, it, just wondered, you know. Well, I mean, it took a time for Prashika to connect to a wider group of foreign donors um, because it was a challenging organization. It took much less time for BRAC, for example, to do that um, because BRAC, quite early on, I mean, it was involved a lot in the functional literacy some of the conscientization, so on. But quite early on, it saw its role more on the income generating support side, mm -hmm. particularly through microcredit and so on, um, and less on that mobilization class struggle side um, of, the, of the equation. Right. And of course, through the 1980s, that became a stronger shift and a stronger differentiation. At the other end of that continuum was GSS, which didn't really kick off until 1982, three or whatever, um, where um, GSS did not and never did go into microcredit. Um, it really wanted to stay very much on a mobilization, conscientization, functional literary side. Rights based advocacy. Rights and advocacy, based. lawyers, peripatetic lawyers, all the rest, got into all that side. And of course that required complete donor funding yeah. for what you might call that side of social development. So, uh, it was called at that time. So you begin to get this continuum of NGOs um, with, you know, and of course, if you take ASA, um, that also started as a mobilization, income generating organization, but that also rather quickly after it started, started a bit later, that also became just a technically very proficient microcredit, microfinance organization. Right. And that was its, as it were, um, single, uh, tool, as it were, um, and it remains so now. Yeah, and um, but then, of course, I will say that with the increasing association with Prashika, um, which partly started actually through uh, these landless irrigation ideas, so maybe we come back to that in a moment quickly. Yeah. Yeah. But um, you know that. Uh, that association with, uh, with Prashika, I really want to say about Prashika, but also about BRAC and other organizations, that um, this wasn't about me being able to bring very much, actually. Um, this was more about me learning about the amazing innovations and originality and creativity of the thinking here in Bangladesh by this generation of people who have been highly affected, their education also, by the troubles 
of the liberation, the disturbances, and all the rest of it, and their very strong commitments to relief work in the immediate aftermath of uh, liberation. And that, that critique, so it, the relationship was more, in a way, with maybe one exception, um, me learning and listening and trying to sort of put that into a kind of context of thinking about the political economy and struggle and, um, you know, those sorts of processes and the agrarian changes that had happened in other societies and how that might be engineered in a positive way for the landless in Bangladesh. So it was an interaction, very much so, with, with I think, more of the learning on my side. <laughs> so in a way, did, did this influence your own ideological thinking? Yes. And the, and the progression that happened over well, the that, years? Yes, because, uh, and uh, uh, it's good. I like these questions because it makes me think in ways perhaps I haven't quite before. So, in across the globe, as it were, where you had many societies, I'm thinking of Latin America in particular, and you have many societies who are moving out of these sort of quasi-feudal, pre-capitalist agrarian relationships into something else that was increasingly part of a post-colonial global industrial economy. Um, uh, you, you, you really had to see that picture. And there was a, a Marxian discourse about that. It was referred to in many ways as Mar neo-Marxism. And it was referred to also as dependency theory in the way in which these countries, formally independent, but actually still, a, in a sense, in a colonial dependency <coughs> upon the, the metropolitan colonial countries, but including America. So, and in that neo-Marxist discourse, there was the idea that the peasantries in these countries could themselves be mobilized yeah, to change these societies without going through the kind of classic Marxian dialectic of peasants becoming proletariat and then being sufficiently organized to confront capitalism. This neo-Marxism was attributing more agency to mobilize peasantry to confront their agrarian oppression and also to change the terms of the labor process as um, dependent capitalism entered their economies. So come back to Bangladesh, Prashika's work, you know, that kind of process of depeasantization, if you like, or bringing peasants into active struggles against kind of global, the, the inequalities reproduced by global capitalism, you know, was part of our dialogue and part of our mutual thinking. And in many ways, I suppose, you could say, Sean Wells can correct me, maybe that's what I brought to Prashika, that, that kind of wider thinking. Uh, yeah. And, and that was also the change, for probably from your theoretical perspective to a more practical, uh, applied perspective. How one know, could yeah, bring about changes. Bring about change, yeah. Bring, bring about change, yeah. right. But picking up on another aspect of your question, so the NGO community more also widely. transformed over the years. Yes. I mean, it became I more mean, of a service delivery sector. Well, for many, yes. And I suppose Brack was a a, a good example, I mean a very good example, as in being very efficient, uh, professional at what it does, what it did then, what it does now, um, but into more of a kind of technical services agency. And this represents uh, yeah, an interesting challenge, and I picked it up in a paper that I wrote in the 90s. Um, about the, the franchise state um, because I felt what I was seeing 
was that a number of NGOs were moving away from, as it were, the mobilization discourse into the technical services mode of operation. Um, and, of course, they were doing that, you know, with very good motivation and all the rest of it. And they were doing it in multidisciplinary ways. I mean, Abe was always incredibly proud of reducing maternal mortality and new child mortality. One of his biggest indicators. So this is very multidisciplinary technical services intervention. Uh, Number of but them. in a way, what they, these NGOs were doing was franchising technical services, substituting for the state. These services in many ways should have been rights-based from a state that could manage to deliver those services. But the state in Bangladesh was very slow to be able to do any of that. And so NGOs were plugging that gap. Now, there were people at the time in that process who were then saying, well, a lot of these NGOs, in a historical sense, were performing a revisionist function. Because they were, in a sense, weakening the relationship between people, poor people, and the state with these intervening agencies that were essentially charitable, philanthropic, and voluntary. I mean, people don't have rights in relation to NGOs. They only have rights in relation to the state. Right? Now, if the state commissions those NGOs, then you have rights indirectly. And that's the kind of franchise issue. But for me, this relationship contributed to a core problem of governance in the country because you're reducing the weakening the direct accountability link between state performance and people's rights entitlements and the poor delivery that they are generally receiving unless they're lucky to be adopted by an NGO. So I saw this as a governance problem um, and there were all these donors, right, who were on the one hand supporting all these NGOs because they thought it was so difficult to put money into the state and it would get lost, diverted, and all the rest of it. So for their own aid constituencies back home who wanted to see effective delivery, safer to put it through these NGOs. Value for but money. It, but in my view, sorry, just finish, but in my view, there was a structural problem with that because they could be, it could be argued that they were contributing to the undermining of governance by strengthening these NGOs between the state and the people, right? And yet at the same time, many of these donors had governance programs trying to support the quality of governance in the country. And I saw that as a contradiction and for you, donors. And you talk about that in your, in your book. Do. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, I was thinking that, you know, we've spent number of, number, a bit, quite a bit of time to listening to you. I mean, we have a small group here, and I, I wonder whether we could open up the floor and get some questions. You know, whatever thoughts you have, just to put them to Jeff. And then we can conclude the last probably five minutes or four minutes or whatever we have talking about the future. Okay. You know, looking at the crystal ball as we said. So, shall we open the floor and get some questions? Please, the mic. Okay. Well, if it's not a question, uh, I think you don't mind. Not at all. Just, yeah. just a tribute to, uh, just a tribute to Geo Food. Uh, Actually, I, I'm very thankful to uh, Maruk because he invited me uh, to have a glance over the gentleman. Uh, back in 1992, uh, I, I read your book, uh, I think, Breaking the Cycle, and I picked up, uh, uh, picked up a small sentence. Uh, I think Bangladesh is the laboratory for international poverty studies. And I started my uh, PhD with that uh, small sentence. 
And I think in 1994, I got another, another book, uh, uh, Bangladesh idea whose interest well that also had some you know space in my uh, dissertation when I was defending my thesis uh, the examiner was professor Greg Lloyd from Cambridge and uh, he just told me Bangladesh whose idea whose interest I was wondering whether that was a question to me or and I said uh, Jeff would knows it best I don't know <laughs> however I had to, to get my PhD within stipulated period, so I thought that I should not bargain more, and uh, I was trying to convince him in my own way. Jeff, thank you very much. I wanted to see you, and this is, an, this is a great opportunity that I could see you. I think I had other opportunities looking back at Jose and Shana's. If I could, I could talk to them earlier, they would have arranged me a meeting with you long, long ago, <laughs> but I didn't do it. And uh, for, for Munjur Bhai, I, I saw Munjur Bhai after, after long days, it's also a good meeting. Thank and uh, again, I, I have particular thanks for you because you mentioned Ezadim uh, Abdullah Khan, the, the, the civil, real civilian. Uh, unfortunately for, for a country like us, this kind of people are, uh, are misjudged by so-called uh, progressive people. And uh, interestingly, uh, as I found from your deliberation, uh, that uh, I mean, the left-leaning politicians used to talk about poor people, talk about people's rights and everything. Then at one stage it came to the NGOs, and now I surprised that it is the America who is talking about, you see, the right of government workers and others. What about our like, politicians? What about our, our you know, institutions? Thank you, Jeff. I'm, I'm extremely grateful that I could see my sort of teacher and, and, uh, and what not that I started my PhD with. Thank you once again, and I will again ask you, Bangladesh, whose idea, whose interest? Thank uh. you. Okay, so there is a question. There is a question. There is a question. So, a anybody else would like to just comments, thoughts uh, to Jeff, because he's put a lot of labor into this, and we are very fortunate to have this book. Uh, any thoughts, and then I'll go back to Jeff, and he can then conclude. Ekra, ekra. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Jeff. My long known, uh, my. F f uh, I like to ask you two questions. One is very general question. What is or what was your motivation to write this book? And the second one is, how do you see the transformation of Bangladesh society in the 52 or 53 years? As you were, you, you were seeing Bangladesh uh, at the time of its, its birth, transformation of our society and your motivation. Okay. And what you see is... Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. please do. And what you see in future, which will yeah. be the okay. second last part of the discussion. Thank you. I will, I will come back to whose ideas, whose interests. Um, <coughs> but let me engage with this first. Motivations for writing the book. You heard a little bit, um, uh, because when Moedin Ahmed suggests something, um, you pay attention to it, and I do want to uh, pay a strong tribute to him. We miss him. Maruk is here taking on UPL in a very strong, committed way. And I do want to just say that it's important to understand that publishers like UPL are <coughs> really a significant part not just of the intellectual life of the country, but also of stimulating necessary dialogues within the country that engage people in forms of thinking and so on that hopefully will um, underpin um, you know, policy and progressive policy thinking in the future. So. All credit to Marut for carrying on and deepening the tradition um, from that. Um, okay, I'm not quite sure what the, uh, the noises were, but um, we'll <laughs> plow on for the moment. Now, the motivation beyond that for writing the book is that, you know, I've been uh, involved in development studies, the teaching of international development, through undergraduates, 
master's students a lot and PhD students and in the UK uh, done little bits overseas as well and I would say that most of their motivations for wanting to study development issues globally and all the rest of it whatever era you talk about since the Second World War that they also have commitments to do something better for societies around the world. You know, they want to contribute to positive, progressive change. Often connected to global poverty, but gender, climate change, yeah, you name it. And I, I suppose really what I wanted to say to that generation of students is that you can be a pure academic and you can stay with your principles intact uh, no challenge to them uh, so you can enjoy a certain kind of purity and I know development studies academics like that and when they meet people like me you know they they tend to look at you in a slightly different way because you've lost your purity. Yeah? Not in the ivory tower anymore. Not in the ivory tower, outside, be, trying to be pragmatic. And of course, once you're outside the ivory tower and your concepts and your theories and your ideas and so on touch reality, then the world becomes a very messy place. And it's full of difficult debates, compromises, um, uh, adjustments to one's principles, um, so on and so forth. It becomes a kind of confusing process. A lot of uh, choices to be made. Lots of choices, lots more options on the table for how you behave and interact. Um, and I wanted to share that, to share that complexity, that messiness and the contradictions and the conflicts that you're going to be part of once you not just engage with reality in a research sense, but when you engage with reality in a change sense of trying to change. So that was a key motivation. Whose ideas, whose interests? Um, I mean, at the time, I was putting um, a collection of essays into that book. Um, and quite a few of those essays were describing a tension between donors and, you know, almost you could say their clients here in Bangladesh. Different ministries, different NGOs, and so on and so forth. Um, and donors, of course, have their agendas. Um, and they have their principles, if you like, uh, as well, which they think should apply to the society and be the definition of development in that society. Um, and they put money behind that thinking, their thinking, and those ideas. And in that sense, they are trying to shape the society in that image. Um, so, you know, donors don't, you know, they, you could say they exact a certain price for their state post-colonial philanthropy. Um, they, and that price is, you know, do it our way and you get more money. Do it your way and we will be more critical. Um, that's a shorthand, yeah? So whose ideas, whose interests. So I saw this as a sovereign challenge to people in Bangladesh. Now, of course, you know, we've made Bangladesh a complex society in which lots of people are not very progressive, you know, uh, regressive in many ways, of course. But when you've got a society that clearly had inspirational, progressive, innovative, creative, original development ideas, that actually have led the world. Let's be clear about this. 
you know, they picked up on those constantization ideas coming from Latin America, Régis Debray, and so on. But my God, you know, in Bangladesh, they've been changed. So my concern was, were the donors listening to the crea creativity of Bangladesh and supporting it, or were they trying to impose their own agendas? And maybe that partnership is better now. Maybe there's more listening, although in some cases there's less money anyway. But also these donors, you know, they, they write their white papers, they write their policy ideas about development, they emphasize certain themes, and they want their aid to reflect that emphasis. But that emphasis may not be seen as the priority need in the sovereign society in which they are engaged. So it continues to be an issue. And it needs to be transparent, should be openly debated, should be an open dialogue. And I think that, if you like, the sort of strength of Bangladesh, alongside many problems and weaknesses and so on, but there is a strength in Bangladesh to say to donors, um, you know, at least back us in some of what we do, um, even if you don't want to back us in other things that we do that you don't like. Thank you. Jeff, I think we need to wrap things up. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, I mean, it's 50 years, you said. It will be nearly 50 years. Yeah, yeah. A lot of friends you have got here and a lot of uh, fabulous memories and which you have included in your book. Bangladesh has come a long way, all said and done, right? In a way, looking ahead, it's difficult to do this, but your concluding thoughts, really, as, you, as, you, as we move forward with all the changes which have happened. Yes. Um, well, um, Many people, of course, ask me over the years, could I highlight you know, maybe the most significant or the two or three most significant changes? Um, and I often answer, Iriboro. I often say that the addition of the Iriboro paddy season has been transformative certainly in contributing to food security or a high element of it and without food security a society does not have sovereignty so those two things strongly go together so Iriboro has contributed to the sovereignty to the real independence of Bangladesh so as it were let's not forget that as a as, as a key element of the change. Which brings me a little bit to what I am currently doing. Um, uh, two or three hours ago, I completed the first draft of a paper. Mujum Dabai here is uh, part of this. is a program that we have at BIDS. And the title of the paper, which is, the ink is still wet. It's only a draft, it's got a long, long way to go. But it's called The Political Economy of Agrarian Futures in Bangladesh. Um, so, but, we have to wait. Well, no, not, you have to wait too long. Okay. At least for some of the ideas. Um, but, uh, so we've just been doing a scoping study, field visits and so on over the last few months, uh, different parts of the country. I haven't been doing it because I've been back in Bangladesh struggling with COVID and other things. Um, but um, to what I've had conversations with Benai uh, over several years now um, about the lack of attention to the 
contemporary nature of the agrarian political economy, the rural political economy in Bangladesh. We all did lots of this work in the past, and then in the last two decades, lots of attention on agricultural growth and productivity and the technical side of that, and lots of data on that, good or bad, and so on and so forth. So we have quite a lot of understanding of that, but we haven't taken that understanding back into what's happening in terms of class relations, power, the redistribution of returns from agriculture away from the cultivator into extended supply chains for inputs, the capital coming into agriculture, and the extended market chains that are coming into the cities of Bangladesh. Um, so in other words, the rapid expansion of the agricultural system with so many more players in that system reinforced by investments in uh, rural physical infrastructure from the 1980s onwards and added to now in the last 15 years or so by digitization all of which is bringing people together more closely across the delta. So various ideas come out from this. Um, so what will Bangladesh, what might Bangladesh look like? So one idea is that it might not look like the rest of South Asia. It might not evolve like West Bengal or other parts of North India with similar topographies, ecologies and so on, or indeed Pakistan and so on. Bangladesh might start to look more like Southeast Asia. Um, and what is happening in Southeast Asia, South Korea, Taiwan, I, the bits of Southeast Asia that have the bigger hinterlands, Vietnam and so on is that we see a form of urbanization arising out of agrarian change, but also impacted by insertion into the global economy, global capitalist economy. We see not just large scale mega city urbanization, of which Dhaka is one of the world's biggest now, very rapidly, very rapidly. But we also see that in the countryside as well. We see it physically, growth poles, small towns, and we see the dots increasing on the maps all over the country in this way, partly stimulated by Upazila decentralization as growth poles, partly stimulated by feeder roads connecting Upazila centers, Therefore, growth poles, therefore the change in the hinterlands of those growth poles, changing the cropping patterns away from non-perishable grain staples, more into vegetables and fruits which are perishable but can now reach markets quicker, fish, storage better, all that kind of thing. So a complete diversification and a commercialization of... Is it agriculture or is it horticulture or is it aquaculture? It's agrarian diversification and change. So, and that is shifting the returns, as I've said, away from the cultivators to all these other actors in that economy. But with that goes this sense of what I've called for a long time, urbanization. What was, <coughs> say that again? Urbanization. The rural urbanization, the urbanization. I haven't made up that term. Geographers used it decades ago. Right. Um, but I'm rehabilitating it um, in the same way as I want to rehabilitate the word alienation um, from its doldrums conceptually. That's another story. But urbanization. And I really want to say very strongly that we're not just talking about the physicality of urbanization but urbanization of the mind, of the mind. And one of our informants, 
I think it came from some of the field work that Mazumda has been involved in. And he said, I'm not directly quoting, um, our village is like a city. So it's a village, but it's like a city. What does he mean by this? Well, first of all, he's got a strong concept of what the city is, even though he doesn't live there, because of course, that interaction, fluidity of migration, digitization, television, he can see the city. Well, what he's also saying is, our village may still look like a village, but it's increasingly behaving socially, culturally, like a city. We spend less time in the community. We spend less time with each other, doing community collective things. We are more individualistic. We go back to our homes at night. We shut the door, we lock the door, and we watch the telly. Um, or we do things in the family, help the kids with education. We've got lighting now, we can do that, and all the rest of it. So we're leading a city life in the, in, in, in the village. This is a mindset change, uh, an important mindset change, which actually changes the way in which people interact with each other. And what's more then, it changes the whole approach to making contracts with each other to manage the land and to manage this rapidly changing agriculture, horticulture, aquaculture. So that's a change that we're beginning to capture, if you like, and we need to do a lot more research. So this is only the first stage and we shall be trying to write up what we've done so far, I've started that, in order that we can try and get actually some quite larger scale funding so that we can really get an insight inductively into these ingredients of what Bangladesh might look like. And my hunch at the moment is it's going to look more like Southeast Asia than it's going to look like South Asia. Well, something to look forward to. Jeff. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. But I think, thank you very much, Jeff, and I do hope that you will continue to investigate, analyze, and write about these changes that's going to happen in the years to come. But thank you for your friendship and the, all, the, all the sort of warmth that you have brought to the relationships that we have developed over the years. So let me say a, great, a huge thank you to you for sharing your thoughts and thank you to Maruk and UPL for organizing this. Wonderful. And thank you all for coming and to others who are watching us on Facebook and other social platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Well done.